there, welcome to Summit Online. This is where you'll find the weekend worship experience coming right to where you are. In fact, we have two ways to watch. First, you can access the full worship service on demand on our YouTube channel. So don't forget to subscribe. This is a great option for families watching together. Or maybe you missed the weekend service and wanna catch up later in the week. Second, we host a live service on Sundays at 9 or 11 a.m. at live.summitchurch.com. We never want you to worship alone, so this is an awesome opportunity to connect with a digital community through the live chat option. Plus, we have hosts, actual humans, ready to connect with you, answer any questions, or pray with you in our digital chat rooms. If this is your first time joining us, I am so glad that you are here. In fact, I believe God has a purpose in you being here today. Here at The Summit, we exist to create a movement of disciple-making disciples here in the Raleigh-Durham area and around the world. We pray this worship service allows you to grow deeper as a disciple of Jesus Christ. That's what this is all about, the good news of Jesus. So our service will begin shortly, but before it does, I want to let you know about all the ways that you can engage with us today. First, our desire is that families would watch this service together. So we offer resources for all ages, including today's sermon transcript, as well as kids and student notes for your families to follow along. Second, you can give financially. All that you give goes towards all that we do to propel the mission of God forward. And finally, we don't want you to worship alone. So can you think of someone that might wanna join you today? Go ahead and text a friend and ask them to tune in with you. For resources, ways to give, opportunities to connect, and a free download for our first time guests, you can text Next Steps to 33933 or visit summitchurch.com slash next steps. We look forward to worshiping with you today. Hey Summit family, I am so glad that you're joining us today and I hope that you are participating in the 21 days of fasting and prayer. Are you participating, Jonathan? I, I am. Okay, yeah. so what are you fasting from? This would be really awkward if I wasn't. Um, <laughs> the I, I, I chose to take seven days and fast uh, solid food. So I'm doing water, juice, and coffee, uh, but no solid food. And I'm, I'm trying to do it for seven days. I thought 21 days might be a little too much. I'm trying it for seven days. The other thing I'm fasting for is I've deleted like anything that would just be kind of a time waster on my mm. phone, um, apps or games or social media. Um, and so I'm trying to take any of the time that I would just be kind of scrolling on my phone in time of, uh, that'd be a cue for me to just to be in prayer. Right, I love that. Like you said, it's a cue just to mm -hmm. go and talk to Jesus. I'm actually fasting from going out to eat. So when I have that urge to go to Chick-fil-A or to get a cup of coffee, that reminds me that I need to go spend some time in prayer. And that's what I love about fasting is that it really gives mm -hmm. us that cue to go to Jesus. You know, Jonathan, one of the things that I'm praying for is mm -hmm. actually all the people online, for you guys, that you would continue to grow as disciples wherever you are. And I'm praying that our reach mm -hmm. would double because wow. I believe that this platform allows more people to hear the good news of Jesus. 
And if people haven't started fasting and praying with us, what should they do? I'd say just start. You can go to summitchurch.com slash prayer for resources. You can sign up for daily passages of scriptures and way to pray, even like uh, ways that you can fast if you haven't started yet. And I would just say, just jump in and begin. I think anything that is gonna draw you and remind you of your need for God in, in praying and fasting is gonna be worth well worth your time. And the small things that you may begin in doing this, the Lord will surely bring to fruition, I believe, in your life, so. Yeah, I love that. I actually signed up, and so every day when that comes into my inbox, I just take a moment and I can pause mm -hmm. and pray for a few minutes, and I love it. But if this is your first time here, I want to personally welcome you. You know, I have the privilege of talking to so many of you throughout the week. Actually, Jonathan, just this week, I got to talk to people from Canada, Michigan, Indiana, Tennessee, and right here in North Carolina. I don't even think we can go to Canada right now, so that's awesome. <laughs> so crazy, yeah, it's amazing. And if this is your first time or you just haven't even connected with us yet, please text the word WELCOME to 33933 and you'll hear from someone on our staff. Well, before we begin, I want to remind families that we have resources available to help you and your kids and students engage with today's sermon. You can actually just text the word NEXT STEPS to 33933, and it will just take you to a page with all of our weekend resources, as well as some information about all that is going on in our church. And kids, listen up. We are about to sing a song called Great Things. So when you hear those two words, great things, I need you to spread out your arms like this. Great things. Got it? Okay, right. great things. All right, Summit, turn up the volume. Let's worship together today. Welcome Summit family. We're so glad that you could join us today, wherever you're joining us from, whether it's your living room or, or wherever you're at. Let's lift our voice together today. Let's declare the great things that God has done with a loud voice. Say, so come let us worship. Come let us worship our King. Come let us bow at His feet. He has done great things See what our Savior has done See how His love overcomes He has done great things He has done great things Oh, hero of heaven, you conquered the grave you free every captain and break every chain Oh God, you have done great things We dance in your freedom, awake and alive Oh Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high Oh God, you have done great things yeah. Oh, hero of heaven, 
conquer the grave You free every captive and break every chain Oh God, you have done great things We dance in your freedom, awakened alive Oh Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high Oh God, you have done great This is who we worship, our God who alone does wondrously great things. This is who we have gathered to worship. So whether you are gathering online by yourself or in a home gathering, we gather to worship this great God. Listen to Psalm 84, verse one and two. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs, yes, faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and flesh sing for joy to the living God. Down in verse 10. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. You feel that this morning? This weekend, you feel that? I would rather be a doorkeeper keeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. You know, as a church family, we've been going through uh, 21 days of prayer and and fasting. We hope that you're joining us as we pray to the Lord and as we seek his face, we ask great things from him. We attempt great things for him. One of the ways uh, that, that we engage with God and we hear from him, we're changed to be like Christ is engaging with the word of God. It gives us language to approach him. So you think maybe the the idea of of praying or prayer seems uh, overwhelming to you. Use this Bible, use Psalm 84. We're gonna put it back up on the screen and just give you a few moments to voice a prayer to God from these verses. Let it shape your prayer. Let it give you content for your prayers. Families, you might want to help your kids pray these things. My soul longs. Help them understand what you're praying right there. Help them understand what it means to, to say for a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I'd rather be with you than anywhere else. You take a moment. Let's pray some of these passages together and then we'll continue to worship. the world will bow down and say you are God every man will bow down and say you are king so let's start right now why would we wait king Place. We 
just want to be with you We just want to be with you Yes, the world will bow down and say you are God. Every man will bow down and say you are King. So let's start right now. Why would we wait? We can pray. Summit Church, I, I wanna open up today by leading us into a time of prayer around three um, really important issues this, this weekend. The first is, um, this is Sanctity of Life Sunday this weekend. Uh, this is a nationally recognized Sunday on which we lament the terrible tragedy of abortion. Um, the date for this Sunday is always, um, whichever Sunday is closest to January 20th, when the Supreme Court legalized in 1973, the, um, the killing of children in the womb. 
Summit, we, we want to be a place that is clear about the tragedy and the unqualified injustice of abortion. But we also want to be a place that extends forgiveness and healing um, uh, and, and a place that seeks to understand that, that often those decisions are made in a lot of pain and confusion. So we not only want to be clear about what is right and wrong, we also want to be a help and a resource to those who feel like they had nowhere else to turn. Um, I actually will be preaching a message on this next weekend, Lord willing. But today, today on Sanctity of Life Sunday, we want to acknowledge this and, and mourn it and pray for it because um, uh, because we join with other churches around the country in, in, in doing this. Um, second is Monday of this coming week is Martin Luther King Jr. Day. That is a day in which we express gratitude for the progress that has been made in becoming a more just and fair society. It is a day which um, we affirm, on which we affirm the dignity of all peoples. And it's a day in which we acknowledge the ongoing work that needs to be done in this regard and recommit ourselves to that work. And so we want to pray for that also. Um, by the way, um, just in case you are curious about this, we don't commemorate these two dates together because we believe that you can't talk about one without talking about the other. It's simply because both are nationally recognized days on our calendar. We don't have any control over that. Um, but I want to pray for those two things. And then third, I want us to pray for, for our nation. Um, what a difficult, what an incredibly difficult couple of weeks. And probably more than ever, we are aware of spiritual forces that are at work in our society that seek to divide, uh, to sow anger and hatred. And, and what a great time for us to be giving ourselves as a church to these 21 days of prayer and fasting. Um, and regarding the events of last week, let me just, just say this. I want to urge you to avoid any temptation, any temptation as the body of Christ to excuse evil, as a means of accomplishing good. The apostle Paul warns in Romans three about God's wrath on those who say we must do evil that good may come. I know some of you have legitimately righteous things that you're worried about in this election, many of which, many of which those concerns I share. But as the people of God, we must avoid the temptation to wink at, excuse or justify evil, lies, slander or the like as a, as a means of accomplishing that. There is a time to vote. There is even a time peacefully to protest, but there is never a time to excuse evil in the name of good. And and there's always a time to pray. So I want us to do that together now, whether you are joining us um, at home, uh, online, if you're by yourself, if you're with your family group, or if you're at one of our campuses, let's bow together and let me voice a prayer um, to God on our behalf. Father, I want to pray from the position that you have given me just as a representative of the body of Christ and you've put me in this community at this time to plead for your help, to plead for your power, to plead on behalf of a community for forgiveness. God, we pray that you would change these things that so grieve our hearts and, and know that grieves yours even more. God, we lament the tragedy of abortion. And God, we ask for forgiveness on our society for for tolerating and even celebrating, God, this injustice. We ask God that you make this church a place of healing. We ask God that for those that um, even this weekend are struggling with that choice or maybe the regret that comes from having, having gone through that, God, we pray that we would be able to extend the blessing, the forgiveness of Christ and for them to be able to see that you stand with open arms, not an accusing finger, but open arms to receive and forgive and restore. God, we ask that you use us to advocate for justice and we ask that you cause a swift end um, to this terrible scourge on our nation that has seared our conscience. God, we rejoice in this weekend on a lot of the progress that has been made in becoming a more just and equitable nation. And we thank you for that. But God, we also mourn, God, some of the, the legacy and the, and the continued pain that results from, um, from years of this uh, sin and racial strife. God, we know that you are the Prince of Peace and only you can work peace. So God, begin it in this church. God, as we love each other and, 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 and listen to each other and humble ourselves before each other and seek to regard the interests of one another um, as even more important than our own. God, let us be zealous for, for justice and, and, and fairness. Um, God, we, we thank you for what you're doing. We pray that you would do more in this church and we pray that that would overflow into the community. 
And finally, Father, we pray for our nation. God, we are aware that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but it's against principalities and powers. And so God, we ask that you use this church to push back the tide of darkness. God, let us not compromise our witness. Let us not compromise our message by, by excusing, excusing evil in the name of good. Father, we pray that you would use us to be a pointer to the hope that is only found in Jesus. And God, heal our land. You told us that if we would humble ourselves and pray, as we're trying to do in these 21 days of prayer and fasting, God, we pray that you would heal our land and point our community to, to Jesus and give them a hunger for righteousness and justice. We pray these things because God, sometimes we don't know what else to do. And God, we know that's the best and most important and first thing we ought to do. So we pray together in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen, amen. Well, you can have a seat if you were not um, already seated. You can take out your Bible. And uh, if you're there at home and go run, grab your Bible, if you don't have it, I want you to open it to Luke chapter 11. Um, it is hard to believe as you're turning there, I'll tell you it's hard to believe that this year will mark 20 years since the 9-11 attacks, uh, two decades. Uh, they say that those attacks rewrote the book on how nations think about warfare, modern nations. Uh, in previous wars, you had a, a defined entity like Germany or Japan, but the 9 11 attacks were carried out by citizens of countries who were our allies, some by people who lived right here within our own borders. Um, after the attacks, if you recall, Congress felt like a declaration of war was appropriate, but they weren't even sure what to call uh, what to call that war. Previous wars had been known as the war with England or the war against the Axis powers, but this was a war against terror. So the media dubbed it the war on terror and the strategies for fighting it were, were, were different. You couldn't just build up an army and go after the enemy. There were no territories that they really called home. So we started to hear about things like sleeper cells or radicalized operatives. These, these realities re required different strategies for fighting and different security protocols. And of course, that gave rise to new dangers like the invasion of privacy or, or, or racial profiling. Uh, many of the hit drama shows at the time, and I realized that we got a a lot of young professionals and college students that weren't even alive during this time yet. But, but a lot of the hit drama shows of the time, shows like 24 or Alias, they played on the premise that this new war, this new kind of warfare was very dangerous and we better learn the new rules of engagement or we would never survive. Well, I share that because I think you'll find parallels in how Jesus instructs us to approach the Christian life in Luke 11. He says that if we don't recognize the real nature of the enemy, then we're gonna be ill-equipped to survive the battle. You see, just like in the, in, in the war on, the, the so-called war on terror, our enemy in this battle is not one entity that we can isolate and identify. He doesn't have a headquarters somewhere like Hollywood or big business. He's not at, at work in only one particular culture that you can identify and isolate, nor is he isolated to one political party. You're gonna certainly find him at work in each of those things, but he's also at work in our churches and in our families and even in our own hearts. And see, that requires different strategies of engagement. Uh, by the way, in illuminating these things for us here in Luke 11, Jesus also was gonna answer a question that a lot of us ask, particularly around, around the new year. And that is, why do we struggle so much to bring real change into our lives? Why do we struggle so much to bring real change into our lives? Most of us have things that we'd love to change. But many of us are discouraged at our persistent inability to do so. Some of you did not even make a resolution this year because you don't need anything else to feel guilty about failing that, amen? Listen, Jesus is going to explain that that's because spiritual forces are at work in us. The reason we struggle sometimes to, to bring actual lasting change is because, because we are wrestling not just against flesh and blood, but against spiritual forces. And apart from his power, any attempt to change is doomed to fail because we are wrestling against the power that is greater than us. And so we're doomed to fail, even if for a little while, he's gonna show you, even if for a little while, it looks like you succeed. Let's take a look. Uh, uh, let's take a look. Luke chapter 11, verse 14. Now, Jesus, now Jesus was driving out a demon that was mute or that was making the man mute. Now let's just stop right here because some of you might say, really? Like Jesus actually believed that some physical or psychological problems were caused by demons? Short answer, yes. And that is consistent throughout the Bible. 
There's a lot more going on behind the scenes in, in these things than we might realize. Maybe that strikes you as naive. You say, well, now we know here in the 21st century, we know that diseases have viral causes and emotional and spiritual problems can be explained by psychological and, and sometimes even physiological stresses or the result of past trauma. And by the way, I don't think Jesus would disagree with you. That is not in, inconsistent with what the scriptures teach about these things. And, and it's why God gave us the scientific method. But, but Jesus would say that if you think all of life's issues can be explained by merely physical factors, well, then maybe you are the naive one. Do you really think that, that the root of the Holocaust was just a, a man with chemical imbalances? Do you really think that the strife and, and the division we experience in our own society now is simply owing to differing political ideologies? When we see the rage that animates the discussions that we're in, how can we not see evidence of evil spiritual forces at work whose intent is to divide and to destroy? Today, when we look at our society's disregard for the lives of innocent babies in the womb and the, and the dogged determination to celebrate our right to discard them, how do we not see the evidence of spiritual forces at work? When we think about the tragic history of, uh, of racial blindness or blindness on racial injustice, how, how do we not recognize in, in, in that tragic history the hand of the enemy? So yes, evil in our world has physical explanations, but if you think that physical factors alone explain all human evil and suffering, perhaps you, perhaps you are the naive Eve one, Jesus would say. And that's why the vast majority of people throughout history, even today, the vast majority of people around the globe have recognized the reality of supernatural spiritual forces at work. It's one of the things that almost all religions have in common. And that's not because everybody else around the world is so naive and we alone are so sophisticated. Now, to be clear, this is not to say that every problem is directly connected to demonic activity, not at all. Just that according to Jesus, these things are sometimes at work. Back to verse 14. When the demon came out, the man who had been mute spoke and the crowds were amazed. But some of them said, no, 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 he drives out demons by Beelzebul, the ruler of the demons. Now, quick note here, um, Beelzebul means the ruler of demons or Lord of dung. Scholars say it was a bit slang, uh, kind of a curse word in those days, calling somebody the Lord of dung, but using the, the curse word for, for, for dung. Calling Jesus the, the Lord of the demons, the Lord of dung was a way that the religious leaders could explain away his power. I mean, Jesus obviously had supernatural powers. Nobody was denying that, but they didn't want to acknowledge that he was from God because if they acknowledged he was from God, then they would have to submit to him. So the only alternative was to say that he got his obviously supernatural power. He got that from Satan. Verse 17, knowing their thoughts, by the way, by the way, have you noticed how many times this phrase occurs in Luke? It's another hint by Luke that Jesus is God because he always knew what everybody was thinking right away. So he told them, he told them every kingdom divided against itself is headed for destruction and a house divided against itself falls. If Satan also is divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? Now, this is as logically simple as it gets, right? How does it make sense that Satan would empower Jesus to destroy Satan's other works? If Satan is the one behind certain diseases and afflictions, if he loves to spread, spread dung into people's lives in the form of disease and death and strife, why would he then turn around and empower Jesus to clean up those very things? Satan's works go the opposite way of Jesus's. Verse 19, Jesus continues. He says, and if I drive out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your sons drive them out? For this reason, your sons, your, the people, your leaders are gonna be your judges. Here, here's his second piece of reasoning. If I cast out demons by Satan's power, then by whose power are your sons casting them out? By what standard, in other words, are you gonna say that my power is from Satan, but their power is from God? If my powers are from Satan, maybe, maybe your powers are also. What he's doing is he's showing them the inconsistency of their accusation. Theirs is not an honest intellectual objection. They're just making up objections because they don't really like Jesus. By the way, 
I found that exact same insight really helpful when I'm talking to people about the gospel today. A lot of people come up with objections, but they're not real objections because they would never apply those, those same standards to themselves. Many Muslims, for example, um, apply a historical cynicism to Christian history that they would never apply to their own. Um, they believe all these conspiracy theories about the Bible, but would never look at their own history through the same lens. Or maybe on your college campus, you will hear professors apply a cynicism to the historical evidence for the resurrection or, or, or the writing of the Bible that they wouldn't want to, they would, wouldn't want to apply to any other event in history. They assume that for this one event, that there was some elaborate, almost inexplicable historical ruse or, or, or they'll raise questions and objections from Christian history like, what about the Crusades? And they'll imply that, that those things invalidated Christianity itself. And when you respond by saying, well, 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 yes, the Crusades were indeed a tragic, a tragic chapter where Christians departed from Jesus' teaching. And you say, but I'll see your Crusades and raise you Mao Zedong's China and Stalin's Russia, which in the name of atheism committed genocides exponentially larger than anything that happened in the Crusades. When you say that, they, they respond, well, that's got nothing to do with the intellectual integrity of, of atheism. And Jesus would say to them, as he says to these people, why are you applying a cynicism to me that you would never apply to yourself? Perhaps your cynicism has less to do with intellectual honesty and more to do with a dislike of Jesus and his claim of authority over your life. So Jesus continues after two devastating pieces of logic. He says, verse 20, and if I drive out demons by the finger of God, but then you should know that the kingdom of God has now come upon you. This finger of God image here is a reference that every one of those religious leaders would have recognized. The finger of God was a phrase that the Egyptian sorcerers used to describe the power that Moses displayed in the, in the plagues of the Exodus. In the Exodus, you might recall this, God did a series of miracles to convince Pharaoh to let the Jews leave Egypt. You, you remember this? Well, for the first couple of plagues, the Egyptian magicians were able to, to use some trickery to replicate some of the plagues. So for example, Moses threw his staff on the ground then it became a snake. And the Egyptian magicians had this little trick rod where they could make it look like they had that same power. Um, and now it doesn't tell us whether they were merely you know, doing some kind of optical illusion or if there was some kind of sorcery involved. But either way, in Exodus chapter eight, Moses raises the stakes. And this time he takes his staff and he throws it into the dust. And as the dust, you know, kind of poofed up into the air, it turns into, into what? You remember this? It turns, the dust turns into gnats. And from there, gnats multiplied and covered the land. Well, the Egyptian magicians couldn't duplicate that. They couldn't replicate that. Uh, created an optical illusion where it looks like a staff turns into a snake is one thing. But, but this, creating gnats out of dust, well, they couldn't touch that. And so they, they, they tell Pharaoh privately, this is Exodus 8, 19, this is the finger of God. We can't touch this. Even the pagan magicians knew the finger of God when they saw it. Jesus is now saying, your Jewish exorcists can do some impressive things, but they can't do anything like what you're seeing here. And it's safe to conclude that if the finger of God is present, then so is the messenger of God. The power of the kingdom indicates the presence of the king. And you should see that the kingdom of God has come upon you. Jesus continues, verse 21, when a strong man, fully armed, guards his estate, his possessions are secure. But when one stronger than he attacks him and overpowers him, then he takes from him all his weapons that he trusted in and he divides up his plunder. Now, stop. In this analogy, who is the strong man? You gotta get this straight. Who's the strong man in this analogy? Satan. And who is the stronger man? That's Jesus. Jesus is the stronger man that overpowers Satan and plunders his possessions. In this parable, and this is really important, who are you? All right, you're the property. You're first owned and controlled by the strong man, but then you're liberated by the stronger man. The implication is, and this is really important, you're either gonna belong to one, to the strong man, or to the other, the stronger man. You can't be free of the strong man until you're under the control of the stronger man. See what he says in verse 23? Verse 23, anyone who is not with me is against me. And anyone who does not gather with me scatters. 
Neutrality toward Jesus, he says, is not an option. And so if you are not actively pursuing and serving Jesus, you're against him because you're still under the control of the strong man. You're like, well, I'm not against Jesus. I'm not really a fully devoted follower of his. Jesus would say that category doesn't exist. Unless you're actively pursuing and serving me, you are against me. We're gonna come back to that. But let's first, let's finish this parable um, because Jesus makes the point even clearer in verse 24. When an unclean spirit comes out of a person, it roams through waterless places looking for rest and not finding rest. It then says, I'll go back to my house that I came from. Returning, it finds the house swept and put in order. Now, Jewish law demanded these rigorous cleaning techniques after you'd gotten rid of any kind of disease or defilement. It it even applied to your property. For example, if you had a mold problem in your house, you couldn't just clean it up with soap and water or a bottle of Clorox. Leviticus said, the book of Leviticus in your Bible said that you had to remove that whole section of the wall. And if the mold came back, you had to burn the whole house down. Jesus uses this kind of extreme zeal in cleanliness as a picture of the person who tries to use the law to clean their life up. Now, what does that look like? Well, they get rid of their bad habits, throw all their bad habits out of their, out of their house and cut them out. They get rid of bad relationships right? They get their addictions under control. They turn over in every way a new leaf. They are serious about change, radical change. But verse 26, then that unclean spirit goes and brings seven other spirits, even more evil than itself, and they enter and settle down there. As a result, that person's last condition is worse than the first because now they got not just one demon, they've got one demon plus the other seven, which makes a total of eight. The demons don't mind the cleanup. In fact, they kind of like it. And it certainly does not stop them from coming back in much bigger numbers. The use of the number seven, by the way, there is intentional. It's meant to imply completion. That's what, that's what seven always means in Hebrew. It's like saying the last state of that man is infinitely worse than the first state. Listen, religion and self-improvement, religion or self-improvement apart from Jesus opens the door to more deceptive and more dangerous demons in your life. Now, it's not something you usually hear in church, but it's true. Religious change or self-improvement is often accompanied by pride and judgmentalism and a sense of self-sufficiency. And those things are infinitely worse than alcoholism or or, or a bad temper. Tim Keller uses this illustration. He says, so you got a little boy who falls down and, and scrapes his knee up. And and let's say that he's really being overly emotional about it, right? And so his dad comes over and and his dad says something like, son, get up, be a man. You don't want to be a little pansy for the rest of your life, do you? Stop crying. Okay, here's my question. Can that motivation help that little boy stop crying? It can. His dad's words can help him sweep his house, tame his emotions, get some control. But, But what's very subtly has happened in that little boy's heart now? The little boy didn't just take himself back from being overly emotional. No, now he's given himself to a new master. And that is the master of of being afraid of looking weak. And let's say that becomes a driving force in his life. Never look weak because weakness makes you deficient as a person. So you got to cover it at all costs and despise it in others. Now, I want you to imagine this guy's marriage one day. You can't have a healthy marriage if you're always scared of looking weak and despising those who do, or if you're always shutting off your emotions. So yes, the dad's motivation, through the dad's motivation, the little boy was freed from being overly emotional, got rid of one demon, but he did so by giving himself to a new master, a worse one. The medication had worse side effects than the, than the disease did. So yeah, you conquered alcoholism, but you developed a judgmental and arrogant spirit. That's seven times worse. You overcame your insecurity by becoming a a driven, domineering, and self-sufficient person. That's seven more demons. You avoid conflict by by retracting inward and, and just not having any friends anymore and shutting yourself off emotionally. Seven more demons. You avoid pain by never committing to anybody, never giving yourself to anybody. Seven more demons. You see, Jesus is the only master who can free you from your demons and make you whole again. It's ironic, but freedom in the Christian life only comes from giving yourself fully to Jesus. So now that we're here at the end of this passage, let's ask, what does this passage teach us? What does it teach us about 
about how to change, how to change both our own lives and how we impact others with change. Well, see, Jesus teaches us in this passage that there are two conditions for real change, two conditions for real spiritual power. Number one is in verse 23, write down. Number one, total surrender. Again, verse 23, anybody who's not with me is against me. You're not actively with me. If you're not pursuing me, then you are against me. And anybody who does not gather with me scatters. Until you are under the full possession of the stronger man's authority, you are powerless to fend off the domination of the strong man, Satan, no matter how much you want him gone. Clean up or self-reform or pledges to do better aren't going to do it. You're either all in with team Jesus or you're still on team Satan. To be on team Jesus means that you have surrendered 100% of who you are, not just your bad habits, but all your hopes, all your dreams, all your ambitions, all your ideas, all that you ever hoped to be. You've given that all to him. <laughs> you say, oh, pastor, hold on, hold on, no way. I, I may not be a fully committed Christian, but I don't belong to Satan. Well, look, your argument's not with me. Your argument's with Jesus. Yes, you do. It's what he said. When I was a student pastor years ago, when I was first getting into ministry, I had this little illustration I used with, with teenagers. And I actually thought about doing it here with you today, but I just thought it might be a, a little much. But I, I'll do part. I, I'll give you the gist of it. I used to put up chairs like this um, in front of them and say, this represents a fence. And I would get up on here and say, this represents the person who's in church, right? And they're not fully committed to Jesus on this side. But they're also not like, you know, tried to be a bad person and I want to go, you know, um, I want to get rid of God and I want to follow Satan. And that represents this side of the fence. And there's like, I'd say a lot of high school students, maybe even most high school students in church, they're kind of riding that fence pretty hard, not fully committed to Jesus, not, not totally rejecting him either. And then in this, um, in this little like parable skit, I would have um, different people come from either side representing somebody trying to get them to go to that side. So you got somebody that, that comes in from the, the devil side and they're like, hey, let's go do drugs and let's go, you know, rob stuff. And, and the person's like, no, that's not the kind of person I am. I've got morals. I don't want to do that. And then um, somebody from the other side would say like, hey, let's go. Let's, man, let's, let's, let, let's study the Bible. Let's, let's really, you know, um, let's give ourselves to, to Jesus and his work and ministry. And, and the person's like, no, I'm not like a Bible banger. I'm not a Jesus freak. I don't want to do that. I, and, and, and three or four people come on and the person resists every time. And they're like, no, I, I'm not comfortable either either totally walking away from Jesus, but I'm also not comfortable yet fully giving myself to him. And then at the very end of this thing, um, you have one person comes in that represents, um, uh, that represents uh, the devil and one person that comes and represents an angel. And the angel takes the people that are fully following Jesus this way and, and the, the devil takes all the people that followed him this way. But then at last he grabs this person upon the fence and says, you belong to me too, at which the person strenuously objects and says, no, 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 I never chose you. I never said I wanted to, to, to run away from Jesus and I wanted to go with Satan. And, and uh, uh, the, 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 the demon kind of smiles and says, oh, but you don't understand. See, the devil owns the fence. The fence is actually part of his property. And until you've gotten off of that fence and onto the property of, of being fully surrendered to Jesus, you still belong to Satan because the devil owns the fence that you're standing on. What that means is, is what Jesus is saying in verse 23, that you're either fully surrendered to Jesus You've either taken your hands off of everything or you're still a possession of Satan. I know that's hard to hear, but it's true. Jesus doesn't, or sorry, Satan doesn't care if you, if you, if you, if you don't recognize that. Satan doesn't care that you don't call him master because you still belong to him. You say, well, no, 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 I wouldn't be like those, I wouldn't be like those religious rulers who called Jesus the ruler of dung and crucified him. Yes, you would. Because there's only two teams. It's like we often say here at the Summit Church, uh, in every heart, there's a throne and a cross. In your heart, there's a throne and a cross. If Jesus is on the throne, well, that means you gotta be on the cross. It means you have to die to control of your own life. That's what the cross represents, death to your own control. But if you are on the throne, if you're still calling the shots, well, then Jesus has to be on the cross. He doesn't come just as somebody to, to walk beside you. He comes as Lord and master. And the only response is surrender. So the only question is, are you fully surrendered? Because if you're not fully surrendered, you're not on team Jesus. It reminds me of C.S. Lewis's 
analogy. C.S. Lewis said, we, we come to Jesus a lot of times like people who recognize that our house, the house of our life is in disrepair, disarray. It's dirty, it's smelly, the carpet is old fashioned and worn out. And we hear, we hear that Jesus can fix those things. And so we ask him to help us clean it up. And he does, but then he starts knocking down walls. And you're like, wait a minute, Jesus, I just wanted a cleanup. I wanted to help tidying up my, my room, my marriage, some help tidying up my habits and my career and, and my kids and et cetera. And Jesus says, well, yeah, I can help you with all those things. But to get that help, the house has to belong entirely to me. I don't come just as your divine servant to help you become a more and better you. I come as the owner. I, I'm not here to take requests. I'm here to take over. And if I'm not Lord of all, then I'm not Lord at all. And so it means that if you come to Jesus, the only way to come is in total surrender. To say, Jesus, all that I am, all that I have, all that I ever hope to be, I now and forever offer to you. We don't come to God, C.S. Lewis said. We don't come as bad people who need to be made into better people. We come as rebels who must lay down our arms. That's how we come. Total surrender. We're not here to turn over a new leaf. We come and surrender to receive a new life. Listen, before we go to our, our last point, I actually want to stop right here. And I want to do something that we do often in church, but I, I want to, to give it a particular angle today, take an angle on it. And that is, we're going to take communion together. Communion represents it's, uh, the, 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 the wine and the bread represents our union with Jesus Christ. It represents the fact that the person who belongs to Jesus has given themselves fully to him and his blood has washed away our sins and, and his body, his broken body is now our sufficiency and our strength. And it's, it, it's what gives us the power of new life. Um, if you were one of our campuses, when you came in, you were handed um, this COVID safe uh, uh, communion packet that has both uh, the bread and the cup there together. I want you to take it out and I want you to open it up. If you're at home, you might even want to pause this video if you don't have the stuff in front of you and get something that um, can be the juice and the, and, and the bread for you. Um, we're going to take this together. As you're pulling this out, I, I want to say this. Okay, this is for people who have already trusted Jesus and already received him. It's a symbol. It, it reminds you it declares to yourself and to others, I belong to him. It's not something you do to try to get close to God. It's not something that, that he looks on with favor just because you did it. So that means if you're not yet a follower of Jesus, if you've never received him, then this is not for you. Don't take it. And scripture even says it can be spiritually harmful for you if you do. But I have an invitation for you. And here's that invitation. You right now, as this is in your hand, if you've never surrendered yourself to Jesus, this could be your surrender. You could be saying, Lord Jesus, I receive you. I'm ready to surrender. I'm ready to give my all to you. The point is not the taking of the, uh, uh, of the element. The point is, is, is whether your heart has been given to Jesus. So if you never have in this very moment, why doesn't this become your offer of surrender? Saying, Jesus, I believe that you died on a cross to pay for my sins. And I give myself totally and completely to you. If you'll take this out right now, if you don't have it out, take the bread. And Jesus said, for those who have received me as their savior, for those ready to surrender fully to me, this bread represents my body, which is broken for you. He said, take it. And when you do it, remember me. In the same way, he said, this cup represents my blood that was poured out for the forgiveness of your sins. It's the only purchase price of salvation. It's the only thing that is capable of saving you. Jesus said, I want you, if you have received me as a declaration to others, as a declaration to yourself, if you know that I, you have received me and, and, and I've forgiven your sins, then I want you to take it. I want you to drink it. And I want you to do it in remembrance of me. Right now there with heads bowed and eyes closed, why don't you just express to God your thankfulness for Jesus as your stronger man, for Jesus as the possessor of you as his possession, 
his forgiveness of sins and promises of eternal life and just say, thank you, Jesus. If you've never surrendered yourself to him right now, Lord Jesus, this represents the giving of myself to you, all of me to you. Now for all of you, I want you to ask, God, give me the wisdom to understand and apply what I hear next. Open my heart to your truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Really quickly, right, last thing. Number two, write down prayer. The second way to access the divine power is through prayer. Earnest, unrelenting prayer. If you look at, uh, we didn't read this part, but in the passage right before this one, the first 13 verses of this chapter, of chapter 11, Jesus had been teaching about the power of prayer. You can go back and read it later, but he, he tells a story about a man who had unexpected visitors in the middle of the night and he needed bread to feed these guests. So he goes over to his neighbor's house in the middle of the night and knocks and knocks and knocks and knocks on the door until his friend finally gets up and gives him the, the loaves that he's asking for. And this, Jesus says, again, this is the first part of chapter 11, um, uh, where uh, the chapter we read from today. He said, this, Jesus says, is how you should pray right? Persistently, unrelentingly. And then he concludes that teaching by saying this, verse 13, if you have your Bible, look at it. If you know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the heavenly father give the Holy Spirit, the stronger man, to those who ask him? Then Jesus tells the story, goes right into the story about the demons. But what he's saying is this, if you want the power of the Holy Spirit, if you want the spirit of Jesus, the stronger man in and through your life, that's the Holy Spirit, then you're gonna get it not only, not only through surrender, but you're also going to get that through desperate, urgent, unrelenting prayer. And Jesus reinforced this in another place, by the way, Mark 9. There was a man who brought his son who was afflicted by a demon that caused convulsions in his son. Um, this man brought that son to Jesus. Like the story we looked at a couple weeks ago where the friends lower the guy, you know, and they're like, Jesus, help him. This father brings the son to Jesus and says, help him. Um, and well, first he brings him to the disciples, but the disciples are unable to cast the demon out. So they bring the father and the boy to Jesus and Jesus cast the demons out. After the incident was over, right? And they're sort of debriefing time. The disciples are like, hey, Jesus, why couldn't we drive the demon out? And we tried all the, you know, said all the right things. And we pointed and we, you know, put our hands on his forehead and yelled demons out. Well, why couldn't we, why wouldn't the ball go in when we shot it? And Jesus told him, Mark 9, 29. It's because this kind come out by nothing except for prayer. Mark 9, 29. By the way, some manuscripts add the words and fasting. This comes out ex only by prayer and fasting. God unleashes the power of the stronger man through us into the lives of others, into the son that has the, is afflicted by the demon. He releases that power through desperate, urgent, unrelenting prayer. Listen to me, what your friends, what your kids, what they need is not your sweeping and cleaning efforts in their lives. I don't care how thoroughly, how extensive that sweeping is. What they need is the presence of the stronger man. Your cleaning efforts cannot expunge the demonic activity from them. It takes the power and the presence of the stronger man and that only comes through prayer. So if that's true, we all kind of nod our heads at that. Why then do we spend so much time thinking about how to talk to men about God and so little time talking to God about those men. You see, Summit, Summit Church, that's the reason we've begun this year with 21 days of fasting and prayer. We wanna see the finger of God in our community, in our church, in our families, amen? We wanna see it here in our church. We wanna see it, we wanna see it in our children. Don't you wanna see that? The answer is yes. You see, that only comes, Jesus says, by fervent, unrelenting prayer. The good news is that the stronger man, the strong man, all right, more powerful that, that he be, more powerful than he may be than us, this strong man is no match for the power of the stronger man. Verse 22, do you see it? When one stronger than he attacks and overpowers him, when Jesus attacks and overpowers Satan, he takes from him all his weapons that he trusted in and divides up his plunder. It's a rout. Jesus plunders him, humiliates him. You know, I kind of both love and, and, um, and a little disappointed in how the book of Revelation depicts the final battle. Um, here's why, because it's kind of anticlimactic. 
You got all these battle forces arrayed against Jesus and they're all ready to do warfare against him and, and they show up there and you're expecting some kind of Lord of the Rings style epic battle. But Jesus walks onto the scene and just speaks a word and all his enemies basically evaporate. And I was kind of like, man, I wanted a little more action. After all revelation, I want a little more action there. I want a little more Lord of the Rings stuff. But see, the point is actually even better. Their power is no match for his. He just speaks and they're gone. He's the stronger man. He is the finger of God. You see, the good news is that God has called you and I to bring the power of the strong man into other people's lives. Again, verse 22, when the stronger one, then he attacks and overpowers him. He takes from him all his weapons that he trusted in, all his weapons that he trusted in, and he divides up his plunder. What's Satan's plunder? It's the souls of people around us that Satan holds captive. It's our children, it's friends headed toward destruction. It's friends in decimated marriages. They're held captive by the strong man. We wanna bring them the power of the stronger man. Friend, what Jesus wants to do with you is just, it's more than just help you survive or endure the Christian life. He wants to use you to plunder Satan's kingdom. He didn't just come to give you peace like a river in your soul or warm fuzzies on a cold night. He wants to use you to plunder the works of the enemy around you. But when one stronger than he attacks and overpowers him, he takes from him all his weapons he trusted in and divides up his plunder. We'll see if you knew how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the heavenly father give the Holy Spirit, the stronger man to those who ask him. Missionaries that work in places all around the world where Satan holds people captive under earthly governments that keep people in bondage from hearing the gospel. Hey, this promise is for you. For those of you who are at work in our city, in places where there's poverty and injustice, in pregnancy centers where women consider what to do with a precious unborn baby that Satan wants to destroy, this promise is for you. To parents that are discouraged and feel overwhelmed by the influence of the world on your children, to husbands concerned with what is happening in, in the life of your spouse or, or wives that are concerned in this, this promise is for you. You're like, I don't know how to defend off the strong man. I've tried everything, I've cleaned and I've cleaned and it's just useless. This promise is for you. To those of you who know somebody that, it, 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 that, that you sense is afflicted physically, emotionally, spiritually by our enemy, this promise is for you. Right? You don't need any more sweeping techniques. You need the stronger man and he's ready to use you. But see, these kinds go out only by prayer and fasting. To see as we close, I have a two-part invitation for you. The first one I'll repeat from a moment ago. Are you surrendered? Are you ready to surrender? Did you do that during the time we celebrated communion? In fact, everybody bow their heads if they would. Everybody to bow their heads with me. If you haven't yet surrendered and you're ready to, it just sounds like this, Jesus, I believe that only you can save me and I surrender myself to you. Hey, if you're doing that today, whether you did it a few moments ago when we did communion or doing it now, if you're at one of our campuses, could you just raise your hand? Just hold your hand up for just a minute. I can't see everybody, but just raise your hand there. If you're at home or if you're in front of a computer, I want you to text the word ready, R-E-A-D-Y to 33933. Just text the word ready to 33933. Here's the second part of my invitation. Some of you have been doing battle with the strong man. You've seen the strong man in your kids. You've seen it in the friend around you. There's something that you sense is more than just physical. It's the enemy. What do you need to, who do you need to pray for? Is it you? Is it somebody else? At all of our campuses, if you're at one of the, those campuses, we're gonna have prayer counselors that are gonna come and in fact, they're getting into place right now. All right, I want everybody at all of our campuses, or if you're in one of our home groups, right, and you, it, 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 it works, I want you to stand. Okay, everybody at our campuses, I want you to stand. And I want you to come right now. If you've got some burden that you need to pray for, something that we can just side by side with you, go and with great prayer, say, God, deliver them from the strong man and God, the stronger man, come and take over. I want you to come right now. Don't wait to the end, come right now. They'll be here after the service, yes, but come right now to them. You're stepping out now and you're coming. Right, if you're at home then, and, 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 and this is you and you're like, there's nobody to go up and pray with, I want you to click the request prayer button. You'll see it right there. If you're there on your computer, click request prayer and a live host, an actual human being will, will pray with you right now in the private chat. And if you're watching on, on demand, you can email prayer at summitchurch.com and somebody from our team will reach out to you, okay? Father, I pray for those right now that are unleashing burdens. We pray, God, that this would be a church characterized by the presence of the stronger man 
We pray this, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. What gift of grace is Jesus mighty? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and free. My steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hope, my hope is only Jesus. For my life is wholly bound to Him. Oh, how strange and divine. Can sing all is mine, but not I, but through Christ in me. And the night is dark, but I am not forsaken. For by my side, the Savior He. Come
through Christ in me. Amen. Uh, man, Summit family, one of the things that Pastor J.D. shared, and he shared this before, but you know, in, in every human being, there is either a throne or a cross. And if you are on the throne, then Jesus is on the cross. But if Jesus is on the throne in your life, you are on the cross. And it really does mean that we have to die to ourselves. We have to surrender. Um, but one of the things that I've found in my uh, just time following Jesus is that there's a way to a man that feels like life that in its end, it actually leads to death. And there's also a way, the way that Jesus taught, that actually kind of feels more like death, but its end brings life to us. And so as we surrender to Him, it's amazing how much we receive from Him and how much He meets us in our needs. Wow, that's incredible. And if that's you, if you're ready to go on the cross and fully surrender so that Jesus can be on the throne of your life, then you can text the word READY R-E-A-D-Y to 33933. Or we would love to just pray with you right now. Right now, if you're watching live, you can click the button request prayer and a live host will pray with you right now in a private chat room. And if you're watching on demand, please email us at prayer at summitchurch.com and we would love to pray with you. If you are in the area, we also have in-person gatherings available for you at many of our campuses. Um, also, as our in-person numbers have increased, um, we've been really thinking about as a church leadership team, how best can we continue to worship God in our gatherings together, but how also can we keep everyone safe? So actually beginning January 24th, next Sunday, we'll be moving to two services on Sundays at 9 and 11 a.m. to open up even more space for you to feel comfortable as we worship together. That's awesome. And if you choose to stay online in this season, or if you're watching from out of town, then we will still meet online every Sunday, live at 9 or 11, or you can find the full service on our YouTube channel. Perfect. Hey, if you do call the Summit Church home, I wanna encourage you to give towards the mission here. You know, we put our weekly resources, we give to local organizations that serve our city, we support our missionaries globally, and continue to use all that we receive from you to advance the kingdom of God here in Raleigh-Durham and around the world. So if you'd like to give, you can text the word GIVE to 33933 to set up a one-time gift or a recurring gift. And as one of the pastors at the summit, I just wanna say thank you so much for your continued generosity. The Lord is truly taking it and multiplying it and using it to meet the needs of people all over the world. Amen. Well, Summit family, I wanna encourage you as we begin as a church in these 21 days of fasting and prayer, um, that as you are fasting, when you feel those hunger pangs or maybe you feel that inclination to get on your phone and scroll, um, use that as a cue to turn to God and trust that He is gonna provide something new as you trust Him. The same thing in our prayer, like we're praying for our families, we're praying for ourselves, we're praying for our cities, we're praying for our country. And we don't just pray uh, believing that God is impotent to meet these needs, we pray believing that the God who, who tells us, come, ask, seek, knock, come and ask and I will give to you that he's gonna answer in amazing ways. For more information about this, as well as other resources to help you grow spiritually, be sure to text NEXT STEPS, N-E-X-T-S-T-E-P-S to 33933. Summit, we look forward to seeing you again next week. You are sent. Mm -hmm.